Hey everybody, welcome, welcome on in. Welcome into tonight's live. Hopefully everybody's having a good night. I see Jan's here. I was wondering if you were going to make it because I know you didn't feel good. So I'm glad you're here. I hear everybody's coming down with something. So hopefully everybody's feeling okay. I know that um, I've seen a lot more like people like wearing masks and I've seen more people, it seems like, protecting themselves more. So I don't know if it's because it's flu season or what, but I don't want to get sick. So I, I stayed in, <laughs> um, I went out for like five minutes today and I was like, Oh, Oh, I was like, okay, time to go back home. Hold on one second. Let me grab this. Oh, I was like, let's just, and I saw Isabel was in too. Well, and hello everybody. Extreme blondes here. Boom. I saw Paige was in here and I saw Cheryl was in here first today. She's always first and doodle bug. We got a lot of people in. It's good to see everybody. If you guys don't mind, I'm just taking a second to hit the like button. You know, we, we, I always tell you that in the beginning. And if you do appreciate the content, I hope you guys will consider subscribing to the channel. We are, we are growing our channel over here. So more than welcome to join us. But we are going to talk about Idaho tonight. Um, I'm going to put the channel membership link in the chat. If you guys want to join our channel membership, we'd love to have you. Um, the tiers start at a Titan emoji and it goes up from there. So pretty cool. Pretty, pretty cool. And I think they have actually new emojis for YouTube. So like if you go under your emojis, like if you're a member, like I think that it has like one side's my emojis, like the customized ones and the other side's like YouTube emojis. I think YouTube has new emojis. So maybe everybody gets the YouTube emojis. I'm not sure, but I noticed that they had some new ones. I did, I noticed it, it told me on StreamYard, so I don't know. I haven't used it yet. So that's why I'm kind of clueless when it comes to that. But we are going to talk about Idaho tonight. Um, I've kind of been gatekeeping this part two of the discussion on the Idaho massacre. So we're going to watch that this evening and just give our thoughts on it. Thank you, Stephanie, for becoming a new member. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> oh, Sandy, that, that's so sweet. She said, I watch you every night. Oh, I love that. I love that. I'm here every night. I like being here at night. I was like folding laundry and doing stuff like that before the live. And I'm like, I gotta, I gotta get on my live. Cause I always like to listen to the um, videos and stuff before, you know, I put them on the live. So that's what I was busy doing today was listening to some of these before I brought them on to you guys. So Hey, Arlene. Hey, Kaylee. Welcome on in. I got guys. Welcome on in. Hey, DM. I see that you got your doggy switched back to Christmas doggy, Isabel. That means we're going on a year together. We are. I actually was watching an Idaho video that um, my first Idaho video that I ever put out there, um, like my first live, and it was on the 16th, I believe. It was their first press conference. I came out with a short video that day, and then we did a live that night. And you were in my chat. I was like, Isabel. <laughs> there wasn't very many of us, but, but you were there. But you were there. I loved that. I love going back and then seeing like some familiar names. It's really nice. So it's, we're coming up on a year. So I'm going to have to get like a, a year emoji. I keep saying that. I need to write that down. I write it. If it's on this paper, it never gets done. <laughs> I'm telling you, I swear. I write stuff down like, and then I get up after the live and then I'll come back tomorrow and I'm like, why do I have emoji wrote down? That's me. So yeah, we're com well, coming up on the one year. So one year will be on the 13th. Um, this would have been the last weekend. Yeah. So we're going to do something. Um, we will be covering, you know, the one year, of course, we're going to do like a separate um, live for that. But um, I wanted to do like, um, I'm going to, I think I'm going to do like cover like the full case and then like in my own words. Um, and then I wanted to watch the vigil. If they, they have, they're going to have another one. If they have that one live, like where we can stream it, we'll stream that one. But if they don't have the one live, we'll watch the one from last year. And we'll kind of check in with the families and see where everybody's kind of at. I know that, um, I don't know if it's the same video that you told me about, Jam, but the Chapins came out with a video. And if it's the same one, it's really sweet and sad, but sweet. Really, really good. Hey, Ray. Alive. Yes, we're here. <laughs> Hi, Positive Vibes. I love that name. That's a good name. 
that's a good name to have. Positive Vibes. I need to think of a channel name for my other channel. Um, we have like a second channel, which I was going to put the, uh, let me put the link in the chat for you guys. Um, somebody told me once to have a backup channel and I'm like, okay, let's do it. So we're going to do like more laid back stuff over there, but um, it'll be fun. So if you want to subscribe to the backup channel, you're more than welcome to. We'd love to have you. We're a small little group over there. I'm going to start posting videos over there though. I think I'm going to post um, maybe if it, even if it's just like pre recorded for now, or maybe just my lives, you know, just to have them like on an extra platform or extra, you know, an extra name, um, just so I can get, you know, some views and stuff like that. Cause I know that it's like half now you don't need like, you only need like um, 500 subscribers compared to a thousand and the watch time hours is a lot less. So, um, yeah, it'll be fun, but we'll probably just do, I don't know. I don't know about like members and stuff. We'll probably just keep them over here. That way we're not like all mixed up or anything. But I um, wanted to go ahead and tell you guys about that. Let me get to my notes here. I always write a bunch of notes and I never look at them. <laughs> Hopefully everybody's having a great weekend. Vincent's out there asleep and he's in a crumble cookie coma right now. So last night when we got off the live, I heard the doorbell and I'm like, what did he order? Because we had eight dinner. And I'm like, what did he get? And I walk out there and I've been telling him for like a year, I want to go to crumble cookie. Cause they just like put one in like across the street from us. I walk out there and there is a big, large pink box. And I'm like, oh. so excited. Right. Looked at the cookies, turned around, turned my back for five minutes. And those cookies were gone. I tell you, gone, gone. So tonight he ordered more. So he's in a cookie coma now. So um, maybe he'll maybe he'll join us later for the live. <laughs> oh, oil and oregano keeps you from getting sick. Wow, those cookies are really good ALR. It's they're it, they're they're so sweet though. Like I ate the um, it was like a brownie one. I don't it was I didn't even eat I ate like two bites. I eat like two bites of anything, and I'm like I'm full. So then Vincent has to eat it all, but, the, but they're huge. I didn't realize how big the cookies were. So if you guys have never heard of crumble cookie, I'll give you the rundown real quick. It's just like a specialty cookie store. Basically um, you go in they have like certain cookies that they make per, like on the menu each day. I used to work at a Cheryl's cookies back in the day. Um, but this is, they're like huge. They're, it's like a, looks like a cake almost like how big it was. I was just like, whoa, these things are huge. So um, that was my, that was my day. I went to Target and I ate crumble cookies. So hopefully you guys had a good day too, because that's a pretty good day. Um, so wanted to go ahead and show you this first video here. It came out from Court TV. They're going to, um, they talked about in this video, the evidence against Brian Kohlberger. And um, they give us a sneak peek of tomorrow night. They're going to be broadcasting us a special over Idaho four and particularly they're going to be talking about Brian Koberger and like the case against Brian Koberger. So I think this will be a good video to start the live out with. Um, I just have like a couple little videos, then we'll watch the discussion part two. You didn't necessarily don't have to listen to the discussion part one to really listen to the discussion part two. Um, it kind of just, um, if you watch any, I feel like if you watch any of the podcasts, you can pick right up where they're at. You know what I mean? So I never went in there, Stephanie. I need to go in there, but it smells amazing. I'm <laughs> sorry, right? They were so big. Are they expensive? I bet they're expensive. I didn't even ask because they just look they just look so big. I was like, this is a huge cookie. That's how I, Jan, I'm the same way. I can hardly eat. I, I eat like, if I eat, eat on this side, I'm afraid I'm going to hurt this tooth. If I eat on this side, I'm afraid I'm going to hurt this tooth. So I just, I'm like really weird with, you know, just when I eat and one of, oh, see, one of these days, one of these days, that's my plan is to like eat and not have to worry about like anything, anything at all. Why is it like always, it seems like everybody has tooth pain. Or I thought maybe I thought it was maybe because your teeth were hurting you. It's probably because you're sick though. Do you know what you have? Is it just a little stomach bug or something? I hope you're feeling better, Jan. Tell them kids to be taking care of you. 
you said your grandson maybe gave it to you. But um, I'm going to go ahead and play this video here. If you guys um, don't mind just taking a second, hit the like button. And um, I really appreciate you guys all being here this evening. A year to the date that these murders happened here in Moscow. We know that one of their most important pieces of evidence is, of course, the defendant's DNA at the crime scene. It impacted, like, a lot of people on campus. Yeah, most people try to, like, not bring it up because it's a sad subject to bring up upon, but everybody knows what happened, and everybody mourns, and everybody is upset about what happened. We never go to the bathroom alone, never, like, leave anywhere alone. No, I, I hope he gets put in jail or, like, prison for a while, yeah. And most I mean, most people here do, like, nobody likes him. Welcome back. Monday will mark the first anniversary of the murders of Kaylee Gonzalez, Madison Mogan, Xander Carnoodle, and Ethan Chapin. And this morning, we want to shine a spotlight on their tragic deaths by taking a closer look at what we know about the case against the accused killer. Brian Koberger faces the possibility of the death penalty if he's convicted of these murders. And one of the main pieces of the evidence, of course, in this case, is his DNA on that knife sheath. I think the biggest piece of evidence that jumps out to you is the DNA evidence on the sheet. I think that's the that's the the one piece of evidence that will be hard to explain uh, as a defense attorney on the case. In the Sunday, Court TV is going to air the case against Brian Kohlberger, a Court TV special looking at the case from what we know about it. And uh, to help us along with that this morning, let's bring in criminal defense attorney, former CIA agent Jack Rice. He's up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and. Producer, Court TV producer on Armist is here in studio. And let's start with the, the DNA because that clearly is the biggest bit of evidence from the state. That's the one where you're thinking, well, I don't know how he's going to get around it. And Anna, it's on th this. You know, this is obviously a, a replica. This is basically the same type of sheath that was found right there, right? And, and, and it came back positive for Koberger um, on the button. Yeah, right here on this button, nothing else had any of his DNA, um, allegedly, but this button did, did, and so it makes you wonder why. How did it get there? Jack Rice, uh, there are explanations, though, in, in our special, we talk about it. There's different ways that DNA can end up places where the person has never been, in a room they've never walked into, and objects they've never touched. Yeah, no question about it. Ted, I've had this happen in trials of my own where we found transfer DNA from clients who were actually never at a crime scene. And so that actually can happen. And that's the wild card here. This is something that the prosecution has to be conscious of and in, and in fact address it before the defense is allowed to. But this is the center point in many, many ways because in, in, in for a lot of people, I think we'll see this and they will say, with this DNA, unless you're arguing some vast conspiracy, it's hard to deny. You add up all of those other puzzle pieces and you put them together, this feels right. And that has real power, visceral power for a prosecution team. One of the things that the defense is likely going to bring up, Anna, is this, this house, the house on King, where Let's face it, it was a party house. Um, you've been there multiple times covering this uh, for Court TV. G give us a sense of uh, w w what you take away from it after you're you know, interviewing people and seeing the house. Um, there were a lot of people coming in and out. A lot of people coming in and out, and not just when these victims lived there, but for many years. One thing that you get a sense of is how close the houses are. You don't really get a sense of that just seeing the, the house on TV. The houses are closed. There's people walking all the time. Now, at night, it's very dark. Um, and it was even darker bef when the murders happened. Um, there was a light that was broken or, or just not working, and it wasn't fixed till after. So it's a very dark place at night. And clearly that sliding glass door seemed to be just sort of open uh, and an open invitation for people that live there uh, that likely the killer used to walk in. But Jack, you referenced the other evidence. You've got the white Elantra willy-nilly driving around. Now, it does go out of frame during the actual time of the murders in terms of surveillance camera picking it up. But you've also has the defendant Kohlberger's cell phone, which is turned off. Uh, 
Wow, at the time of the murders, imagine that. How, when you com combine all of it and we look at the state's case, well, what do you see? Right, this has everything. The Koberger case has forensics. It, it has location information. It has cell phones. It has the car. It has uh, uh, DNA crossing state lines. It has the use of, of a father's DNA to track backward to the son. I mean, this is 21st century criminal investigation 101. It truly is. And this is going to be the kind of a case that the state has to very slowly, meticulously build. They have to take these building blocks and put them together and say, let's talk about how we got to Brian Koberger. And if you do this slowly, meticulously, you want to make sure you don't leave any spaces for the defense team. This is what I've been doing for 25 years. My job is to push the seam of the state's case and to buckle it. And I'm always looking for that angle. And he's going to have good attorneys who are going to be working for him. And if the state screws up, they're going to find a way to push that space. And that's the problem that the state always has to be conscious of when they're working a case like this. Mm -hmm. Anna, you, you, uh, part of the, the, you know, the big part of this anniversary is going to be the just the feeling on campus, the, the sad reality of bringing it back for these students. And, you know, you were out there when a lot of them went home. They were just, there was no arrest and people were scared. Um, and in this special on Sunday that's airing at 8 o'clock Eastern right here on Court TV, the, um, the, we had a chance, Chanley Painter drove with Steve Gonzalez on Kaylee Gonzalez's birthday in her vehicle. Um, talk about that, that, that vehicle. Um, let's first start about that vehicle because it was a big part of the case. She might not have even been there had she just, she had just bought this car and she wanted to show it to her buddies, but she, she was on her way to a new job in Texas. Yeah, she was on her way to a new job. She was at her parents' house. And then she got this new car on her own. She paid for it. And she wanted to show it to her best friend, Maddie, and her other roommates. And that's what made her go back to Moscow. Otherwise, she may not have been there. Um, like Ethan, he didn't live there. And he was just there because of Xana. Um, and at the end of the day, we don't know who or why, what, what brought Koberger allegedly over to the home. And Jack, to that point, he was, his cell phone records um, did produce, according to the probable cause affidavit, that, that he was in the area 12 times over the five months before the murders. At least his phone was in the area near that house. And the families, the prosecution says, aha, he was stalking. It, it, does the state need to deliver a read? Let's face the guy has no connection to these people. Does the state need to tell a story of stalker man because that would make sense the, otherwise it doesn't make sense that this guy who's got his life together is a phd so what, what, why would he do this yeah th this is the critical element right i mean the problem with a piece of evidence like 12 times you could make the argument on the other side that he is in the area like so many other people thousands and thousands of people are there what you have to do is put him at the scene and that's what that dna piece does it takes the stalker concept of abstract into the specific. And so when you can convert that into something else, it changes how you look at the evidence. And that's so desperately what it is that you're trying to convince a jury to do, is to look at evidence a certain way. And if you do it successfully, they then can come forward and say, there's no other alternative but this. And that's what the prosecution is gonna be focusing upon, I think. Yeah, and one of the things, Anna, that the f families um, are also having to deal with is the fact that he did wait time. This is going to take a long time, and they're frustrated. They want, th there's a gag order. They want everything out in the open, um, and that's not the case. There's a lot we don't know. There's a lot we don't know. There's law enforcement who, behind the scenes, we get the feeling they want to speak, but they can't. They're, they're, they're gagged, and the families want to speak, and they can, but it seems like they're afraid. Um, there's a lot we don't know. There's a lot of puzzle pieces. What we don't have is the thread that puts it all together. Mm -hmm. And part of the special this weekend, uh, we kind of go into the different scenarios of, of what happened here. Did did 
Kohlberger run into Maddie, maybe, and Xana at the at the Mad Greek where they worked? Um, was it just this guy who had the crazy Reddit post? You know, he was looking for criminals to to weigh in on how how do you work? We talked to Siobhan Scott as part of this special, and uh, she studies the criminal mind, and here's what she's opined that they whoever did this um this is the type of person take a listen i see a theme with him for years um in his online writings of going back and trying to make sense out of himself and i think he was in that category of i'm studying all this because i want to understand myself and so i think that was driving his research there's also in a rather perverse way, perhaps an attempt to develop some sense of camaraderie with other people and to get a sense of maybe I'm really not the only one who has these thoughts and feelings and experiences. What do his studies tell you about Brian Koberger? It's not that unusual for sadistic killers to study criminology. We think of the BTK killer in Kansas, the Golden State killer in California, both had criminology degrees, and the California killer did go on to become a law enforcement officer, and there have been quite a few others. Jack, one of the things that uh, Steve Gonzalez told Chanley uh, Painter when she was you know, driving around with him and, and interviewed him multiple times is that, you know, he's gone back in his mind thinking, what did we as parents not do to prepare these? There's nothing these kids could have done. They. They did everything right. They literally just went home to sleep. And yet that's why, and they end up dead. Give us a sense of why, and you're a big part of the special too, why this story has hit home with so many of us. Ted, I'm, I'm a former prosecutor. Yeah, I'm a former CIA officer. I'm a criminal defense attorney. I handle murder cases and serious crimes. I'm also a father of four. And my youngest just started college. And I, you and I talked about this personally, so I'll bring it up, is that, is that my, my child, I'm sitting in an orientation room with all of these other families, and, and I can feel the hope. I can feel how all of us are pouring everything we have into our children because we want them to be successful. That's what we want so desperately. And we feel it's palpable. Now, those families in Moscow, they're the same. You send your children to college so they can succeed, so they can do something with their lives, so they can take on this legacy into the future long after we're all gone. The idea that somebody, anybody would come in and steal that. These are four murders. That is true. But this is these are four murders of families because how do you come back as a parent? How do you come back and say, I can move forward now? I, I, I can't contemplate what it is that these families are feeling, what their pain is. And regardless of whether Brian Koberger is convicted, whether or not he gets a fair trial, whether or not he, he gets the death penalty, no matter what happens here, that never fixes that question, not really. And I think all of us watching understand what it is to be in that space where you're saying, I just want my child to have every opportunity I can make available and then have that stolen from them is a brutality that I think few of us can even fathom. Mm. Yeah, well said. Jack Rice, enjoy your weekend. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. You can catch Jack uh, um, here on Court TV um, Sunday during this. I thought that he went to law school. Yeah, Bundy did. And I think someone, I felt like someone else did too. That we talk, they talked about BTK. I didn't know that the Golden State um, killer, he went for criminology too. I didn't know that until that that video. I was like, oh, wow, I learned something. Because with this case, you know, it's kind of hard to learn a lot of new, new things with this case. We're just kind of waiting on, you know, court documents and things like that. So, hey, Jax, how you doing? And, oh, I meant to type in, I try to type it in the chat. For some reason, my chat's been really wonky. If your guys' chat's being like that too, maybe go out, come back in. It's it's not you, it's StreamYard or something or YouTube. But um, I was going to say there's, I don't think that there's anything worse, probably worse than, you know, burying a child. I, I don't have children, but I couldn't imagine. I could, 
I couldn't imagine that. So, um, that's just, that's terrible, you know? Um, especially like, I know a lot of the families, um, it's going on a year now. So they all had, they're all celebrating first, you know, bir first birthdays without their loved ones. It's going to be the, um, I don't know how to word it first year of this happening. It's just like, Oh, and then, you know, um, if you have other kids, you know, you have to make sure that you're putting, giving them attention and giving your love to them. I just, Oh man, that's just, it's heartbreaking. And then even on, even for Brian Kohlberger's pa parents, I mean, they're navigating a whole new existence. I'm sure that they go, I, I mean, we don't see it because we haven't really seen them on camera or anything, but it's, that's kind of strange, I guess. No one's really following them around, but I mean, sorry, but it's kind of strange because people follow people around in this case. Um, but we never see his parents at like the grocery or anything, but I'm sure when they go, people are side-eyeing them. They live in a small area. I mean, the Poconos isn't that big. So, I mean, they're probably going through it too. And then to be that far from your kid too, and he allegedly did this. That would be, that'd be hard because you never know. I mean, you know, you don't know what your kid's telling you. He could be saying, Hey, I didn't do this. Or he could be saying, Hey, mom and dad, I did, I did this. Speaking of somebody that, um, it's kind of a side note, the Gilgo beach suspect, his wife, Asa, I guess she changed her mind about a little couple of things. Cause she's going to wait till trial and see what comes out at trial. What evidence comes out. I was reading that earlier and I was like, Hmm. Let me see where I was going with this. I was trying to find something to share with you guys. There it is. Wow. Maybe I should get my glasses. <laughs> um, I wanted to read this article to you guys because I put out a video. This was um, months, months back. It was um, probably like April, but Brian's defense attorneys have come out and they were saying that one of the roommates, they were meaning Bethany had, was holding exculpatory evidence that could, you know, help, um, clear Brian's name. So I put out a video and I was asking people, um, if they thought like what they thought the exculpatory evidence could be. And I said, um, could it be that Bethany couldn't place him in the house on a prior occasion, um, you know, then the night of the murders, cause she didn't see him apparently like meaning it could help the defense say that the knife sheath was left there like prior. Um, so like we saw the body cam that came out and one of the kids opens the door and they say like the, um, homeowners or whatever, the renters aren't there. So I'm wondering if the defense was going to try to like use that as sort of like exculpatory evidence saying that like Brian left the knife sheath there on a prior occasion. Um, so I saw this article by daily mail today and I was like, huh, they're kind of going the same direction that I was going with that. Um, they're just calling it more of like a party house, but I figured I would read this to you guys, get your thoughts, opinions on it. And then we'll play the, um, podcast. And then I have some newer pictures to show you guys. Um, they're not like brand new, of course, but, um, some newer pictures to show you on the podcast too. That way you have something to a visual to go with it. Um, this is Idaho murder suspect. Brian Kohlberger could claim in his trial that home where four students were murdered was a party house, which could, would explain why his DNA was found there. Idaho murder suspect Brian Kohlberger could claim in his upcoming trial that the home where the four students were killed was a party house to explain why his DNA was found there. The former criminology PhD student is accused of stabbing four University of Idaho students to death in their home off campus on November 13th. Kayla Gonzalez, 21, died alongside her best friend, Maddie Mogan, 21, housemate Zana Kernodal, 20, and Kernodal's boyfriend, Ethan Chapin, 20. He has been held at Latah County Jail in Moscow, Idaho, since January while awaiting a trial, which has been pushed back after he waived his right to a speedy trial. Criminal defense attorney Jack Rice says Kohlberger's defense team could claim that the off-campus property where the murders took place was a wild party house where plenty of students would go. It comes after FBI agents returned to the scene to collect more evidence, taking precise measurements of each room for 3D modeling that can be presented to the jury when the grisly case eventually goes to trial. 
One of the most important parts of this case is the DNA. And what we know is that this is a party house, Attorney Rice said in, new in a new documentary clip obtained by the New York Post. We know that there are hundreds of kids in that house. It could have even included, it could have even included him. And the thing is, if he was in the house, are you suggesting that these four knew everybody who's been there? I doubt that. All of a sudden, you might be a completely different, you might have a completely different trial, he added, in the case against Brian Kohlberger documentary, which airs on Court TV on Sunday. A knife sheath, which Kohlberger's DNA Okay, I'm, I thought I was reading this wrong, but I am I am reading it wrong. I'm I just can't read. A knife sheath with Kohlberger's DNA was DNA on it was found by police alongside the bodies of the victims last year. But the suspect's defense team could say that because hundreds of students may have previously partied inside the house, his DNA could have been there before the murders, according to Rice. The defense previously revealed that they would be contesting the notion that Kohlberger DNA was left at the scene on the knife sheath. They also claim that DNA from three other unidentified males or men were also found at the Idaho crime scene. Neighbor Jeremy Reagan claimed that there were constantly people in and out of the home, but he added that the parties had slowed down before the murders took place. They did have more stuff going on there, but they definitely nowhere near as loud as loud as crazy. Okay. That doesn't make sense. Um, Kohlberger's legal team have hinted at him having an alibi, but have not yet revealed what it is. Well, they did. They said he was driving around. Evidence corroborating Mr. Kohlberger being at a location other than the King Road address will be disclosed pursuant to discovery and event eventuary rules, his aunt, attorney Ann Taylor said in July. Kohlberger is believed to have meticulously planned the murders of Madison, Kaylee, Ethan, and Zana with a probable cause affidavit noting that he had repeatedly visited the area around their home prior to the killings. The document also said his DNA was found on a K-bar knife sheath found next to the bodies of Madison and Kaylee and Madison and that he was seen in the home by roommate Dylan Mortensen, 19. Kaylee and Madison were discovered dead in bed next to each other while Ethan and Zana were found on the floor below, with Zana covered slumped over on the floor in her, of her bedroom. According to the document, survivors Mortensen and Bethany Funk heard something of what happened, with Mortensen telling the cops she heard Gonzalez say there's some one here at approximately 4 a.m. 10 minutes later, she heard a thud and crying from Xana's room and a male voice saying, it's okay, I'm going to help you. And then they have like this little animation here. I remember last year when this first happened, we were, everyone was trying to figure out the layout of the house. I don't know if you guys were around for that, but it was, that was, that was crazy because nobody knew like, where the bedrooms were or what the house inside looked like. So everybody was speculating. Like I remember seeing people writing on napkins and like Reddit post, like there must've been at a restaurant or something. They just wrote on a napkin, like what they thought the house looked like. And people were coming out, like creators were coming to the platform and um, like ex law enforcement and stuff like that. They were coming to the platform and um, they were kind of helping people get a better understanding of it. Um, it says at, um, 4 15 or 4 17 a.m a dog was captured barking loudly on a neighbor's security camera around the same time mortensen said she opened her bedroom door again and saw a tall male with bushy eyebrows leaving through the sliding glass doors at the back of the home she described how she had been frozen in shock as the black clad male walked towards her and said she locked herself in a her room after he left a shoe print was later found outside her door the affidavit also reveals that kohlberger's white hyundai Elantra was captured on camera near the scene before being seen driving rapidly away from the home towards Pullman at approximately 4.20 a.m. Police rapidly connected the vehicle to Kohlberger and noted the similarity between his appearance and Mortensen's description of the intruder at the rental home. I believe that's all of it. Yeah, that's all of the um, article there. Okay. So, I mean, the defense could try that, I guess. I mean, I, that's what I said. I, I, I kind of said, what if they tried that? You know, I mean... Yeah, yeah, you can't. Yeah, you know, yeah, I can take a 3D tour now. Yeah, you can now. They have like a bunch of websites now that like dedicated to the house, but before there was like um Zillow was like shut down really fast or something. It might it might have come back up since then, but it was like shut down and I found it on college pads. And I don't even know where I found that website because I've never looked for a college pad before, but 
I found it on there. And, um, but I don't know if you could go in the inside. I don't know if you can go on the inside at the time. Yeah, you could, you can go on the inside. But I remember it, like, um, a creator named Johnny law, he came out and he helped like, um, do like a 3d animation or like 3d buildup of it or something. And I was just wondering about him not too long ago. And I'm like, wonder what ever happened to that guy? Cause he was a good creator and he just kind of left. Like he dipped in and dipped out. Like he was on like news nation and everything. Like he was doing really good. I don't know what happened, but um, I'll go ahead and play the podcast here for us. It's about an hour long, so it's kind of longer, but they have Joseph Scott Morgan on there as well. Um, in the beginning of this podcast, they talk about, um, they compare the Idaho, you know, murders, they compare it to, um, the Piketon massacre. So if you hear like anything about the Piketon massacre, basically what that was, was, um, in Piketon, Ohio, a family of eight people were, um, brutally gunned down in their homes. And, um, it was done by another family all over custody of a child. We might have to, we might have to do that case. That's a, that's a, a good one to cover because it's literally like one family against another family. They took them all out in one night. Um, so they'll, if you hear them say like the Piketon massacre or the road and family massacre, that's what they're referring to. Mm -hmm. And welcome in everybody. Oh, this was a news article that I was reading. Oh, I was just reading the chat. Oh, this is Daily Mail. Sorry. I can give you the, um, here, let me give you the, the link. It's hard to see the chat whenever I'm reading. Actually, I can't see the chat at all when I'm reading. <laughs> okay. So we'll go over and we'll play this. And like I said, um, as I'm like, as you guys are listening to the podcast, I'll put different um, like pictures in front. That way you guys will have something visually to look at. Uh, I downloaded some different ones today because I think they're basically, they talk about Brian Kohlberger the whole time. Um, so I try to get, you know, pictures kind of go up, match up with them. Well, thank you, Otto. There's, oh, Wes is here. Oh, hey, Wes. Thank you. How you feeling? Everyone's feeling bad. I got these actually. Um, you guys helped me. Warby Parker. They're I love these glasses. I only wear them to um, read because then I start to get a headache, but I was getting a headache earlier. So that's why I put them on. I had like the worst headache today. And I was like, I was like, darn it. If I have a headache and I can't go live, I'm going to be really upset because it was really like bothering me. And I was like, uh, uh, we don't do that here. We don't play that game. We get Botox done over here for our migraines. But I think I'm about due. I think it's next month. So that's probably why I was getting a little bit of a headache. But I'll go ahead and play this. I have it fast forward through the commercials, so it should start right on the podcast for us. And I'll be in the chat with you guys. If you guys don't mind just taking a second, hit the like button. If you guys are appreciating the case coverage so far tonight, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be alerted to all notifications. Netflix. Investigators believe Koberger killed Kaylee Gonsalves, Madison Mogan, Zaina Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin inside of a rented home not far from the University of Idaho campus. At the time of the murders, Koberger was studying at Washington State University, which is just a few miles away from the crime scene. Outside Koberger's apartment in Pullman, Washington, detectives were moving boxes and bags from the apartment. They just kept coming out with more and more stuff and loading it into evidence vans. But in that list of what they brought out, they do not list knife in that evidence list. This is The Idaho Massacre, a production of KT Studios and iHeartRadio. Episode 12, a discussion part two with forensic expert Joseph Scott Morgan. I'm Courtney Armstrong, a television producer at KT Studios with Stephanie Lidecker, Jeff Shane, and Connor Powell. In this episode, the producers Stephanie Lidecker and Connor Powell speak with forensic analyst Joseph Scott Morgan to discuss the latest information about the Idaho murders. Here they are now. Talking with the great death investigator, and forensics expert Joseph Scott Morgan, also the host of Body Bags. 
our favorite show here. And then of course, Connor Powell, who's been executive producing and also contributing on the Idaho Massacre podcast, also making the documentary, which Joseph is also appearing in and being knee deep in this case with Brian Koberger and the the tragedy in Idaho, that there does seem to be some similarities. You know, there's obviously very big key differences, but the large scale of these cases, the idea of such an overkill in both cases is probably what has drawn us to them so deeply. And, you know, Joseph was, frankly, when this case first hit the press or when these murders first happened, Joseph, we were communicating real time and you were the first person to really to really not only be covering the case, but also in many ways solve it. You had said the word knife sheath before I even knew what a knife sheath was, to be honest. You called it from day one and have been the leading pundit speaking about it as an expert and also as a human and have done it so beautifully and so important obviously doing that with Piketon as well. What can we talk about that sort of shows how these cases do have some crossover? I've got a word I want to throw out here at the beginning as we're, as we're chatting. And I think it's important. I, I was thinking about, you know, similarities and there are many similarities. That, that word is bold, kind of an innocuous word. It's used quite a bit thrown around in media, but in parlance of death investigation, when you think of bold, that can imply very many things. It goes to the scope. It goes to, even if it's misplaced, it goes to intestinal fortitude, I think, on the part of the individual that's going to do it because they are singularly focused on an objective. And I think that we see that displayed in both the Piketon Massacre as well as what's going on at the University of Idaho and that small little town up there. And this is another piece to this that, again, they're rural both of these locations. I don't, the good Lord Almighty couldn't send down a thunderbolt and it would be any more shocking in these two places, I think, because who who saw this coming? Uh, no one did, you know, back when Piketon occurred and certainly in Idaho, you know, who, who could have even have anticipated this? I, I was just talking the other day with my wife, you know, reflecting back about what were we doing? You know what I was doing? I'm a college professor in a town that's very similar in size. I'm sitting there thinking, just get me to Thanksgiving break. I do that every year. I've, I've had enough. And those people there at the University of Idaho were thinking the same thing. Just get me to Thanksgiving break. I just want to go home for turkey and dressing. I just, I'm so sick of these people around here. And then this happens. And the level of depravity that a person has to have to pull this off. And, you know, we've said this many times and then air quotes go back to the real world thereafter as if nothing happened. If in fact, what Brian Koberger is accused of is true, it's impossible to wrap our brains around, right? But from a forensic standpoint, you've said this since day one, and frankly, before it had even hit the press, just about the level of blood that was at the scene in Idaho, in Moscow, when this crime occurred, was really unparalleled, except for potentially the tragedy in Pike County, where again, the level of overkill was really unimaginable. Yeah, it is. And, you know, we have to think about this is not done. Neither one of these horrible events occurred. We talked about rural. It's not like these occurred out in an open field in a pasture somewhere. These happen in structures. And what do, we, what do we think about when we think about structure? Well, we go home to be home. We go home to have privacy. We go home to be left alone. And when you let that sink in and you think about this level of violence that was perpetrated in these two environments, it's one thing to kill in an open field or out in an environment that's so, so far out there that maybe certain elements might be lost. Not in these cases. Not in either one of them. You, you have what's referred to as containment of evidence. Therefore, if we take that train of logic and we think about the containment of evidence therein, during the dynamics of both of these events, you know, you have to know that at least some elements of, of these tragedies wind back up on the perpetrators, as, as we saw in, in Piketon, I think, to a great degree. And what I believe had occurred in, in Idaho as well, it, you know, you talked about the bloodbath. You know, Pike didn't involve firearms. This is something different. This is as much overkill as is involved in Piketon with multiple gunshot wounds, with multiple victims, these sorts of things. When you're talking about sharp force injuries, these are 
the types of things that require such anger and such fury because you're you're in close proximity within a home or within a place that becomes home. I think back to when I was an undergraduate in college, the, the places that I occupied as an undergraduate student, temporarily they became a home. They were my space, right? And with these kids, these four kids, and they were kids that were in the shared home, uh, it was their home temporarily. And I think about particularly that scene in the bedroom where we have two victims in a bed and they're actually co-sleeping in this bed where this infamous sheath has now come into play. It it was a a bigger bed. And my only thought thinking about kind of the perpetrator interacting with the environment would, that person would have to have been compelled to have gotten up on the bed. So when you begin to think about intimacy and you begin to think about anger, you, you have containment in that environment where these poor young women are being stabbed to death on this surface in a very frenetic type of event. It would have been, I've likened it to the view of a sewing machine needle going in and out, up and down like this and striking only variably, you know, because the arm is is not going to act. Human arm is not going to act that same way. It's not going to be in the same spot. It'll be a variety of spots, but yet there's something very mechanical about it. It's close, it's confined, but we do know this. We have blood that has been shed, so therefore it would have been transferred onto the perpetrator and to the weapon, perhaps, that was being used. It's key here, I think, that they're not talking, they haven't really mentioned at this point about what the DNA that was on this, the snap, as they refer to it, the thumb snap that has to be actuated in order to release this knife. The blood would have supersaturated the surfaces of this knife. It would have been on the leading edges of the blade itself. It would have been on the hilt, the hilt guard that runs here that protects your hand when you're stabbing. It, these knives have a curious texture on the, on the handle. Many of them were made from uh, early on. These are military-style knives, and we heard that early on, military-style knife, hunting knife, and all that. And then they land on K-Bar. And K-Bar, traditionally, you know, our troops used them in World War II. That's where they gained great fame. The Navy, the Coast Guard, but most famously, the Marine Corps. And they're made for hand-to-hand combat. They're very heavy, uh, heavy in the sense of the durability, the way they're made. And so the handle that was manufactured at that time was almost like a wrapped leather that's kind of brushed that would contain. Now, we don't know what the nature of this particular handle is, but just suffice it to say that their blood, the victim's blood, would have transferred onto that weapon. The curious thing is the two young victims that were in the bedroom together, I've always wondered how if there was any cross-contamination of DNA that was brought from those victims upstairs, which I believe were the first victims, because I think that one of them at least was the target of this massacre, how much of that DNA was transmitted to the other two victims, Ethan and Zana, down on the second floor? Because it's almost like an inoculation, if you will, it's kind of a weird term, but you're going and you're introducing this biologic element into, into these two downstairs. Who knows if they were intended, but it would seem that there was not an awareness that they were there in dwelling that structure at the time. But again, we don't have all of that information, but you've got this kind of sharing of evidence. Now, how much of it can be tied back to the accused Coburger? We don't know at this point. Okay. A lot of guff, a lot of stuff going back and forth, as lawyers do. And I, I thought greatly about, you know, why why on the snap itself would you have a, a deposition of DNA there? These snaps on these knives, when you're attempting to utilize them, it's almost like somebody, let's say somebody has a firearm and they're going to do something called dry firing. And dry firing means that you take a, a gun that is unloaded and you go and buy a new weapon. You want to you want to know what the trigger pull feels like. You know, how many pounds of pressure does it take to actuate the trigger as you pull it and drop the hammer and all those sorts of things? If it's semi-automatic, you rack it back and forth, you get the feel of it. And I have I have this kind of vision of the individual that's using this knife sheath that may contain the murder weapon sitting in a chair somewhere, flipping it with their thumb. How much time, how much speed does it require to flip that thing and clear it from the sheath? And then perhaps, just perhaps, if you're in such a frenzy 
sexually motivated or just motivated by anger, you forget the sheath, you drop it because now your focus is there before you lying before you, as you may occupy their same space and you go to work. And the, now the only thing you can think of is you feel the warmth of that blood that's on your person. You've heard the screams, you've heard the moans, you've heard those last gasp of breath leave the body. The next thing you want to do is get the hell out of the place. But what happens? You go down that staircase, that interior staircase leading from the third floor down to the second floor. You make that hard left and you're heading toward those sliders that are there. Somebody pokes their head out, possibly Ethan. There was a sound that was heard. We believe that at this point in time. We know Zaina was up. She was on TikTok. So did she stick her head out of the door? Did Ethan stick his head out of the door? How many injuries did they sustain? Was it overkill, just like the two young women upstairs? Or was it quick just to put separation between yourself and this horror show that you've created and then get out of the place as quickly as you can because everything didn't go as planned. And when we reflect back to Piketon, I don't know that everything went as planned there. You can plan forever, man. You can, but you can't anticipate these unknowns, these unseen things that are going to arise. You know, somebody's willingness to fight back, or maybe it's a mother cradling her child while she's nursing her in bed and suddenly you hear, you know, where there's an awareness that there's somebody in the room and then bam, you know, how, how does that affect the shooter in Piketon? You know, when they hear that gasp or they, they sense that there's an awareness that they're there because they've tried to be stealthy. They've, they've tried to defeat every measure that there is electronically. They've dumped phones. They've, they've used alternate vehicles, all these sorts of things. And you begin to think about this, always have to plan for, for those things that you can't anticipate. And how do you plan for that? Well, you don't. And when you're committing an illegal act like this, you know, it's one thing when a military goes in or a police officer goes in and they're trying to execute a warrant and they're within the boundaries of the law. But now you're doing something that you know good and well is against the law and is the most horrible thing that you can possibly participate in. What other layer does that add of stress when you're trying to put yourself and, you know, put distance between yourself and the crime scene? So Joseph, I just want to ask you something about the, the nice sheath button, because I envision it sort of which the way you did, which is at some point he was opening and closing, opening and closing, and he did it without the glove. He probably did it at home when he first bought it. And I, my thinking is that his DNA got on the inside of the button not the outside because he probably wiped down the entire knife sheath and everything, but he forgot when he closed it, not to get on the inside. And if, if you push too hard, you know, you can leave a little bit of DNA. You can leave a little bit of skin or something like that inside the snap. Is that kind of what you were thinking as well? I had contemplating that because the snaps have leading edges. If you're looking at it, you know, face on for people that are listening to us right now, if you're looking at the snap, the domed, we have the dome surface of the exterior of the snap. And then if you flip it over, you look and you see this kind of concave uh, interior of the sink. And it's got an edge all the way around it. And I have thought about this, Connor, that perhaps when he's actuating this thing, you know, he's sitting in a, I don't know, his Barco lounger, his house, and he's watching television or whatever in the hell he's doing. And he's sitting there and he's actuating this thing, flipping it back and forth. It's one thing. And, and isn't that interesting? Because that's one, that's one place that you would not think of to clean or wipe down that it kind of catches and rubs and takes away that sample. Maybe it is touch DNA, which, you know, we, we've talked about before at length, but just that's kind of a, a refresher, you know, touch, touch DNA originates from dead skin cells. And we slough thousands of these things. That's why people put lotion on. So how much more so at a microscopic level, if we can see, if we can look at our hands and say, golly, you know, I got dry skin. I need to crack and weather and all this stuff. I need to put some lotion. All right. How much more so at a microscopic level, you know, where you're scraping off these dead, dead skin cells that are falling off into that kind of convex area and it could hold on to it. And I, you know, I, I think about the technician perhaps that was in that environment that, you know, had the sheath. Can you imagine that moment when they have the sheath and they don't have the knife and they're thinking, um, and all the other evidence that came out of that home up there just off the campus, the University of Idaho, they're looking at them and said, be careful. This is sacred. This is what we have. This is our offering right here to you. How are you going to treat it? And so the scientist that's taking a look at this thing is they, they're not just going to go in randomly to use this thing, to swab it, 
you know, with the saline solution and, you know, just kind of randomly do it. No, they're going to break this thing down into regions and they'll enumerate it like just randomly, just off the top of my head. They'll say this is section one, section two, three, four, five. And each region will have a number and they'll go through and swab those those areas to see what they come up with. Now, they'll do a control swab, too as well, just to demonstrate, you know, it's a control that you use in a lab. And then they go to every region. And for some reason, as you pointed out, Connor, and you're right, you are, they get to that snap. Now, why would it be that on the smooth, maybe metallic leading edge on the exterior, all other surfaces are clean or are absent any kind of trace DNA, but yet they still recover it from there. I think that that might be shielding. It might be protection. And it doesn't matter how many times you snap it. If they take that swab and they run it on the inside of that lip, they're going to find things. And we, we even find this with latent prints. When people, I, I go through an exercise as a college professor that teaches forensics, and I tell my students, and they always hate me for this because they think about it for days and days afterwards. I say, when we're doing latent prints, I say, okay, when you leave campus today, leave with this thought in mind. Think about how you get in and out of your vehicle. How do you leverage your body in and out of your vehicle? Most people don't think about that. They don't think about the fact that they have to use their key. Perhaps they have an old door lock on it, or they're going to hit the buzzer. Oh, and by the way, they have to stick their fingers underneath and open the door handle, you know, actuate the door handle, then grab the bar, the support bar side next to the window. Maybe they'll push it up and some people will push on the interior glass. Then they're going to have to leverage their self into it to sit down. You're gripping multiple layers. Most people don't think about that. And that's, that's the nature of us as humans. We go through these repetitive tasks all the time. We don't think about where we're coming in contact. That, as a forensics person, is where we can find those little landmines that perpetrators have not thought about. And Connor, you thought about one. So there you go. I've actually referred to the car as a rolling crime scene. So what may have happened with that? Did he plan so much that he had a change of clothes that he changed into before he mounted back up in that car? And then he tossed the clothing. Remember, there was a big stink over, I guess it was the Tuesday after or the Wednesday after the primary crime scene had been worked, you know, on that Sunday, you know, that morning, morning of. And they were talking about trash pickup and how, they would not checked all the trash cans. And I've, I've often wondered, did they miss something? Did they miss something? And it's mass confusion around the campus. You got kids whose parents are calling them saying leave. And I'm sure that not all details were, did they go through and check every single trash can in that little community? Did they look for clothes that had been, you know, tossed aside perhaps in a bag somewhere? Because if, if he is this criminal mastermind, which you know, the media is trying to portray him as, you know, because he was working on a PhD in criminology, which is not forensic science. Did he think enough to show up with a change of clothes? You know, and, and I think that that's an interesting question. And the shoes as well. There were early, there was an early conversation about a pair of vans where there was uh, some kind of print that was left in the hallway. And it turns out somebody else was wearing vans in the house. And they never said what kind of media that the print was left behind. Was it dirt? Was it dust? Was it blood that left this this pattern? But there were other vans that were left there. And there were all kinds of photographs floating around for a period of time, you know, demonstrating different types of vans, you know, that are out there that people wear. You know, it's not just surfer dudes. Let's stop here for a break. We'll be back in a moment. We're interrupting your favorite to pick up the kids at school. Uncertain at the thought of no device and no the NFL family. The episodes there was a mention, and this was just. Stopped. Visit NFL.com/salute. Voting ends Thursday, November thirtieth. One of the things that we talked about in one of the episodes, there was a mention, and this was just stuck out. There's a mention that there was no shower curtain in his apartment. And I think Jeff and I were talking about speculating that could he have possibly taken the shower curtain, put it in his car seat so that when he was driving, essentially there was some type of bubble. Uh, and maybe that's the reason why there's no shower curtain in his apartment. Maybe it was just cheap, poor student. He never bothered. He couldn't care less. But I mean, that's the type of thing you're saying that 
you know, if he's thinking about, he's planning this stuff out that he could have thought about bringing in a change of clothes, having multiple pairs of gloves so that you're tearing off the dirty one, putting it in a bag to dispose of later, but you still have another pair that is clean or something like that as well, right? Like that's kind of what you're talking about. Yeah, creating that barrier that's going to separate you from those cloth seats. And I remember seeing, I remember looking not so much at his dad and him when they had those videos of them being pulled over in Indiana, looking at the seats, thinking, well, is that is that the kind of surface that I would expect kind of a super saturation of, of blood remnant to be left behind in? If I remember correctly, there's some kind of funky cloth. You're not talking about a high-end vehicle here that's going to have pleather or certainly not leather which still you know you that absorbs blood and you can find it but just think about cloth if you've ever had a cloth seat in a vehicle and just if you have a kid and the kid spills something in the vehicle oh my lord god forbid it's chocolate milk of course that's never happened to me but you know you think about what how do you get this out of there and it it requires a bit of elbow grease and it it requires uh, a knowledge of you know what can be applied to to that covering to render it clean and absent that that car though i think holds many keys and it was but steph you had mentioned the the visual capture of this thing on cctv you know and they did the infamous ring that's what they were referring to it as i can't remember it's 20 plus miles i think where they went around to all the cctv spots and you, the car plays a role into that. We have to think, did he have any other conveyance? Well, not that we know of, but we know that he kind of circled about the University of Idaho because the phone's pinging in those specific locations. And this is, you know, they, they're they claiming that they can put him there prior to the deaths. And then, of course, we think that there's a return visit maybe that morning, uh, you know, thinking about well, what's, uh, you know, what's happening? Um, you know, and a lot of us have talked about this. Why isn't there anything in the news? And we've got, you know, that plays into the whole timeline thing where things not reported until noonish or, you know, just shy of noonish. Uh, and he's probably wondering at this point in time, he's very curious. Did he ride back over there? Would you leave Washington state, hop in your white Hyundai and drive back over there and take a look, just a, a peek, just to see what's going on. And how could you be that foolish? Um, so uh, you begin to think about this. Did he think about this thoroughly? And to your point, Connor, about creating this barrier in the car, I think certainly the shower curtain could do that. But if he's such a mastermind, wouldn't he know that, you know, the shower curtain, even though it's in a wet environment, could very well contain some of his DNA because he's bathing in there. And you're going to use that to cover a seat. Uh, That's a very intimate thing, a shower curtain. I don't know about you guys, but, you know, you brush up against it and all manner of things. Uh, You got hair falling off, you know, all kinds of things that can be contained on a shower curtain. Just because you put water to it doesn't mean it's clean. That's an interesting thought. You know, did he create a barrier for that car? Uh, and then those what the the FBI team saw him doing at Poconos with the observations of you know this just constant cleaning of the vehicle you know and they've got this they're viewing this and you know they're he's digging through it he's hauling off putting things in Ziploc bags and crating them off I mean maybe he's fastidious I don't know maybe he's fastidious about cleaning his car looking at going through down the road in Indiana, it didn't appear to be that he was fastidious. Why would he, did he clean it in Idaho and then clean it again once he got to mom and dad's house? I mean, presumably he would have after the murder, if he used that vehicle, he would have cleaned it. Then uh, after the stops in Indiana, he got scared and decided to clean it more. I mean, that's, that's the only way to sort of approach that. But who knows? I mean, did he clean it nonstop for months? Like, you know, that murders happen in the middle of November. He doesn't get arrested until the end of December. Is, you know, is he cleaning every single day? Yeah. And he's becoming obsessive about it. And you think about that. And I, I'm curious from sampling perspective, I, I have to think that, you know, working in conjunction with Pennsylvania State Police and the FBI, when they got this car, I'm wondering what type of samplings did they take from within the vehicle? And was there, did they do any kind of chemical testing to get an idea as to what he may have been cleaning the car with? And talk about tiebacks just at a molecular level. Uh, did he have anything under the sink in Idaho that he had purchased to use for cleaning that they found remnant of in the car that may have varied from what he was using at mom and daddy's house? You know, are there multiple agents that are being used? The question is, is 
when he's doing all of his studies of the tenets of, I don't know, Hans Gross and all these other people that are criminologists, does he have time to go through and dig out a forensic text and begin to see, you know, how to defeat, defeat any kind of, of, uh, you know, um, testing that an organization as sophisticated as the Idaho state crime lab or the FBI crime lab or Pennsylvania state crime lab, can he defeat, is, is he powerful enough intellectually to understand that and anticipate it and defeat anything that they've got going on in the laboratory and defeat what the crime scene investigators are doing at the scenes, you know, the things they're going to think about. Cause I, I don't know, there've been people that, that are saying, you know, you need to go back to Pennsylvania and check, check for unsolved cases and all these sorts of things. Well, to the best of my knowledge at this point in time, he hadn't been charged with anything. Is this his first time at bat? You know, if it is, is he that much of a wonderkind that he can, you know, he can anticipate everything that he has this big brain. You're always going to miss something. You know, the snap might be the thing that would do him in if that turns out to be accurate. You know, if he's in possession of that knife, I think from an invest, this is an investigative part as opposed to a forensic part. But, you know, the provenance of that knife and that sheath, is there some way to tie it back to a purchasing where they can actually physically put that in his hand, that he ordered it somewhere, he went into a sporting goods store or ordered it online from some, you know, from Amazon or whoever or that he decided to buy. I mean, immediately when I started hearing about the type of knife that was being alleged that was being used, I immediately went on a variety of sites on the internet. You know, how hard would it be for me to buy a K-bar? I mean, I've seen K-bars. I go to gun stores. I go to hunting stores. You know, we've got a lot of them where I live. And I see K-bars there. I've seen them my whole life. My dad was a former Marine and he had a K-bar. And, you know, so I'm thinking about that sort of thing. How would you, and why, why choose a K-bar? Why, why, there's a lot of knives out there. You know, they had thrown around the term Rambo knife, which is not a K-bar. It's a survival knife that has a screw off end on, on the handle that, contains things like needles and thread and fish hooks and all that sort of compass and all that sort of thing. It's not a K bar is a classic combat knife. It's weighted and balanced for that purpose. So I'm thinking about these things and thinking, why, why choose a K bar out of every knife that's out there? Is it something he's familiar with? Does he have a history of having an interest in the military? Well, as soon as I thought about that, I started seeing images of him and I don't know if it was JRTC or whatever it was. And there's a picture uh, this picture of him when he was larger than he is today and he's doing push-ups and he's wearing a BDU uniform. And I start thinking, well, he's got some familiarity with the military. Maybe that entered K bar entered in his lexicon. Why would it be that you would choose that weapon to perpetrate such a heinous crime? And he might be many things, but I can tell you what he's not. He's not a special operations person, you know, and special operations people are trained in hand-to-hand combat, edged combat. So this is a daunting task. It's one thing to take a gun out and shoot somebody. You don't need to be a marksman to do that. You start to get into knife play. This is a completely different realm that you enter into because you have to be aware that there is a high probability that someone could take that knife and bury it in your chest. They could take it away from you and you're running a real risk. So why this knife? Why these students at this particular time? It's, it's a, it's an interesting question that I think that the investigators have asked of themselves. Yeah, we have done a lot of research going back to Pennsylvania and et cetera, trying to find a previous occurrence that would point to something that maybe was a pregame to this crime. And frankly, we haven't been able to identify something super obvious, but you know, something about it just doesn't track. And why in the hell, if you're so bright and smart, would you drive your own white car to and from the crime scene, even the next day? I mean, you're really, we're talking about something that's unexplainable, I guess, but yeah, the smartest guy in the room wouldn't do that. Serial killers have budgets too. He may not have had access to another vehicle. I mean, like you, you go to war with what the weapons you have and all he had was his white, you know, Hyundai. Maybe it's some kind of grandiose manifestation that you see being played out here that I, you know, that I'm capable of doing this, you know, and I, th- I think about body bags. I, w- I was amazed and I'm just, you know, kind of mentioning this on the side, but covered the case a few weeks back involving Sam Little and many people are familiar with Sam Little. He, it turns out he's, he's arguably one of the most prolific serial killers to exist in U S history. And they finally got one of the bodies identified from the mid seventies that he uh, actually killed. He killed this young woman in Macon, Georgia. And Sam Little lived to kill. He would take jobs just so that he could be near victims. And he traveled everywhere 
and he he didn't have a dime to his name but he figured out a way to you know lure women in their own environments generally prostitutes all of them just about prostitutes and choke them out and leave very little evidence behind over uh, over the course of time. So is this, are we looking actually at a, a serial perpetrator here? Are we looking at a mass murderer? You know, anything three or more is essentially a mass killing. So you, if it is who they allege that it is, is there so much anger that's pent up? Is there so much hatred and venom that he wants to take out on, you know, this, uh, these poor college students, uh, did it just all come to a head at this particular time? You know, and this goes to motive. And of course, the state doesn't have proved motive. But circumstantially, you begin to think about what are the motivations for someone, first off, to leave Pennsylvania and come to Washington, of all places, to work on a PhD. And I've said, again, Wazoo is a fine school. But, you know, you're, you're talking about going to a very high-end uh, Catholic institution in Pennsylvania to sales to get your undergraduate and your master's. You're in the heart. You're in the heart of doctoral studies in criminology in that northeastern corridor. The state of Pennsylvania alone has four PhD programs in criminology. Uh, you go up the eastern seaboard, you start hitting places like, you know, D.C., you hit New York, obviously, John Jay School of, of Criminal Justice. You go to Boston and north, northeast, northeastern that's there is considered to be their holy shrine. Um, why, why are you going to pack up and head to Washington state? And then you screw around while you're there, because I got to tell you, people that aren't familiar with what it's like being a PhD student, it's indentured servitude, particularly those first few semesters you're there. And the fact that he had enough time to go and do this while he is a TA, a teaching assistant, which he was doing miserably at from what we're understanding that you have, and I know it's really close, but you have enough time to get in your car and drive a, literally across state lines and cruise another campus, you have enough time to do this. And I'm perplexed by that. Can I unpack that for a second? Because you just made a point that I have not heard anyone make, which is that he potentially chose where to go to school, maybe with the idea that somewhere like Idaho would be the easiest place to get away with a murder. Or something even more ominous. Because a small town, you know, they don't, Idaho is not a rich state. They, they don't, they just don't have murder. So there's not as much forensic opportunity for their investigators and would staying in the Northeast or staying in Pennsylvania, maybe if he had this fantasy and he wanted to carry it out, would be more problematic, more difficult. So you go away for your PhD to be in a place closer to a place like Idaho, which would have limited resources to solve a murder. Or if he had some sort of pre-existing social relationship on social media or some interaction with one of the victims, we would only be speculating to say who, if there was some sort of dynamic happening that he perceived as a relationship prior to moving, and that's why he actually moved, because he had targeted one of the victims in his mind already. I'm not making the suggestion that he was friends or that there was any sort of, you know, obvious connection, but a person's screwy brain can really make screwy fantasies happen. And this is not an original thought. Somebody has said this to me, that it's possible that that was one of the reasons for the move. Yeah, I agree completely. And I think that it's something I'm, I'm almost positive that they investigative collective, I'll put it to you that way, are exploring. Because being an academic and being, you know, in academia for 20 years, this is what I do know, is that when you go up for a PhD program, something, when you get to that level and you're studying something as specific as criminal behavior, which criminology is, you look for people to, it's the ultimate in the Socratic method. You're, you're looking for people, they say, to study under or to sit at their feet. Some great scholar in criminology. So what is it that Wazoo has to offer that no other institution in the United States or Europe has to offer, or Canada has to offer. There are fine schools in Canada that have criminology programs. What is it about that location? Who on that staff did he identify when he was at DeSales completing his master's degree? Who was it that he identified at Washington State? That says, that's the person I want to study under. That's the person that I want to set my track on life with because I'm going to go into academia because I got to tell you, you're not going to do much with a PhD other than teach. You can consult eventually if you get enough years, you know, under your belt. So 
with that said, once you've identified and targeted an individual that you want to sit at their feet, if you will, now you have to apply. Well, the application is a bit arduous, as you can imagine. First off, you have to submit writing samples. You have to give them a philosophy letter about what your thoughts are, areas that you want to do research in. You have to name many times some of their staff members that are currently doing. Because, you know, when I mentioned indentured servitude, it's not just about you going to get a PhD. It's about them looking for workers. So if you've got Professor A that is studying a particular area, is this the person that Professor A wants to bring in that will literally become an employee, a full-time employee of the university while working on their PhD? They're going to have their tuition paid for, you know, maybe a dorm, food, they'll get a stipend, and you're going to be at that person's bidding day in and day out. No, oh, by the way, you're going to do research while you're teaching my classes. So after you, you make it through that, you have to have recommendation letters. Who wrote recommendation letters for him? Who was it? Who was it that sat down and thought that Brian Koberger would be a great candidate for Wazoo? And was Wazoo the only place he chose? That's another sticking point, because I got to tell you, as an investigator, if if you're, I don't know, maybe his GRE scores, which is kind of like the SAT, maybe his GRE scores are just off the scale. He could choose anywhere he wanted to go, and he's solely focused on Washington State. And he's done research at a master's degree level that's going to fold back into that. Who is it that he's going to study under? Who is it at DeSales or whoever that wrote him these letters of recommendation? And that's why this peeling of the onion to get inside of his head and trying to understand what he's doing is is very important, I think. And to this point, I know that they have certain privacy issues at work, but I have to think that the authorities have begun to look into this. I hope they have. As a matter of fact, I hope that once they had identified who he was, this is the first thing that they did, you know, because the world's a crazy place. Next thing you know, files are deleted and all these sorts of things, and it's gone. You want to be able to catch that data as quickly as you can to try to understand what he's doing. Because if that is the purpose, then you begin to develop a timeline. And timeline is what we work on in investigations and forensics. You arrive in June or May, you know, after you've been accepted. You get there, you find an apartment. You drug your ass all the way across the country. You set up an apartment. You got a job. You're supposed to be going to class. You're supposed to be doing research. And you have to account for every second that you're in a PhD program. Every second they demand it. They want you to be. Well, the next thing I know, he's being disciplined. I'm hearing things about him being disciplined, that he doesn't get along well with students. He's arrogant. You know, all these sorts of things that kind of come out about him doesn't get along with colleagues. You know, who does that when they first show up at the door? It's one thing if you've been working someplace for two or three years and it turns out you're a jerk. First day there, you show up, you're a jerk. You know, how long is this going to last? And plus, these people are going to give you grades. So are you, are you really bought into the process of getting a PhD? I think it's a legitimate question. And so why Wazoo? Why that location? Why the University of Idaho? Why, why those poor souls, those four kids that are, you know, literally in the conclusion of their undergraduate career, their lives are wrecked. Their family's lives are wrecked. They're dead. What set them apart? Why Why that location? That brings us back to the place being a party house. You know, we hear that anybody in the world could have walked into that house. And look, most people that are out there that have been undergraduates in some place, you're familiar with the house where everybody would go and congregate and hang out. Even if you were sitting on the front porch drinking a beer. Oh, yeah, they got they're tapped a keg. We're going to go over here. It's cool, man. It's about being in college. You're hanging out. This is that kind of place. The sliders are open. Remember, nothing happens up here. You certainly don't have quadruple homicides. Everybody, we trust everybody. Come and go as you please. That one view from outside that I think the Sun or the Daily Mail had pu- published, that that shot of the table, you can see it. it's a classic shot now. And you've got solo cups sitting on the table. you got all kinds of crap that are in there. I'm not judging them. They're college students. You're, anybody could have come and gone. So is it possible that a person that wanted to end the life of somebody, and this goes to going back to Piketon, you know, what, what do we know about the Wagners and the Rodents? Well, they're, they have familial ties. They go to one another's homes. They, they've crossed the thresholds of one another's houses. Now, this perpetrator, this alleged perpetrator, Ryan Koberger, the accused, certainly wasn't family, but you can set yourself in a kind of a quasi-familial relationship. Remember, we're talking about making a home. 
You know when party night is. Generally on, generally at college towns, party nights are Thursday nights. People are checking out the next day. Maybe Thursday night, they throw a kicker every single Thursday night. People would filter over from the Greek village. It's literally right down the road. Who's going to know who this guy is? He comes walking in. He's in this environment. He sees it. And one of the most chilling things that came up for me is terrifying to me, particularly as a father, is that damn TikTok video that those kids put up where you can see just in that quick flash, you can see that great room, that great room, family room, kitchen slash open concept, whatever you want to call it. We've got a great open floor plan. Yeah, you do. And in it, broadcast for the whole world to see is an interior upward staircase and an interior downward staircase. And I see the sliders. I know where they're at and I know who's in there. So if I were inclined to perpetrate something like this, I've got a snapshot. Now, I might not have the entire truth, but I'm kind of oriented. And if you're an obsessed person, just imagine watching that on a loop. You got nothing but time. You're not going to class. You're not doing your job. You're sitting there doing nothing but watching. And if you're already tracking somebody on social media, wow, what a big old slice of cake for you, huh? You get everything. You get everything you're able to see into that world. What are my points of ingress and egress? Well, that's sliders. And I know behind those sliders because I've ridden around that property so much, there's a place I can park my car up there. Oh, there's a hedgerow. Let's go up there at night. Let's go see. I'll wear black shirt, black pants, maybe a black jacket. It's Idaho. It's going to be cold. Let me just pull over here and see if I can get in these bushes and sit here and watch. See what happens. Maybe I'll bring my binoculars with me. And at a distance, you know, when the lights go on, when lights go off, you know, when people are going up through their bedrooms, when they're shutting it down for the night, you can time it. You can look at it. Okay. Well, she shuts it down at this time of night. Are there food orders coming in? We've got DoorDash. Do they use DoorDash? Is that a way I could get in? Is there anybody else that's pulling up, leaving? Is there a regular that shows up? Is there some member of the football team that shows up that I need to think about? Might could beat my ass. You know, do they have boyfriends that are football players or whatever else? Do you have a good old boy showing up in camouflage that's been deer hunting all day? And he's got a gun and a knife. And I don't, I'm not going to have a chance against him. So you sit out there and you watch it and you observe it. And there's that classic shot. And I, I love that, that they put this out there because we've got those. There's that shot of the investigators. Actually, you can see them. Somebody in the media captured them doing this. They were going to the hedgerow and they were squatted. And they're looking back toward the house. See, the cops are thinking about this. They're thinking about points of observation all the way around. And when the time is right, when you've worked yourself into a frenzy, you drive up there in your car, you park it so nobody else sees you. Remember, we're getting ready for Thanksgiving holiday. Everybody's guards down right now. It's not, it's not like you're in October and you're, you're right in the middle of party season. You're sitting there and you're watching and you're waiting. You've got gloves on. Maybe you don't. Maybe you've got certain types of boots on maybe you got shoe covers you can go buy shoe covers i was just in a hardware store the other day you can you can buy coveralls that cover your entire body zip them up just like we use that on crime scenes so you don't get paint on your clothes you got gloves anybody can get gloves and you got your k-bar where are you going to put the sheath well maybe you're carrying it single-handed because you got something on that's covering your person underneath you're not going to hook it to your belt it's got a belt loop so you're walking in with this thing in your hand you know the slider is open you're going to quietly open the slider and you know where the staircase is. Remember, you've either been there for a party or you saw the TikTok video. You make a hard right when you walk in, you walk up that staircase. And there, lo and behold, there are two girls in that bed. And they are shocked and terrified. And you go to work. So the perpetrator, whoever it is, this is fish in a barrel. For somebody that has a mind for the sort of thing, that wants to perpetrate this sort of thing. Because it's, it's not like you went in in a blaze of glory. And people can hear you shouting and screaming and all that sort of thing is going on. This was done stealthily. And that's something that Piketon has in common with Idaho. There's stealth involved. You wait till the right moment. You wait till you know that everybody is out for the evening. You know that you can defeat the CCTV. You can take the, the mechanism that records everything. You know where the dogs are. You're friendly with the dogs. Maybe you bring snacks for the dogs. You know that you're going to have to have firearms. Well, these are college kids in Idaho. Maybe not firearms. Maybe a knife is all I need. Yeah, that's up close and personal too. I can live out this fantasy there. 
the motivations behind these two things are probably completely different, but there's anger involved in both of them. You know, you've got these elements of overkill in both of them, but it required stealth and it required some level of precision. I think probably more precision in Piketon because you got four separate scenes that are spread out over this ungodly space. When I rode, rode through that area taping, I was amazed at first off the isolation of it. And secondly, how, f- you know, the three houses are kind of close together on Union Hill, but you've got that, the fourth one. It's off in the distance, and buddy, is it isolated. you got pipe sunshine in out there. And it requires stealth. It requires precision. You know, you're going to do this under the cover of darkness, so you got to make sure that you're there before the cock crows, that you can clear out before anybody else sees you. You have to be able to dispose of these things that you have purchased or identified as something that you want to use. So there is similarity in both of these cases. I think that Piketon, for me, is more planning took place when it came to this, we know. And plus you've got multiple brains working here to plan, you know, this, this infamy, if you will. Right now it would appear that they've identified only one person that's, that's thinking about Idaho, but planning nonetheless went into this. This is not something that was just simply decided on a whim. You showed up prepared. You certainly showed up with a knife of some kind. Let's stop here for another break. To this year's jingle for an alternative to traditional lip and go by. And it's military. There was a filing yesterday from Brian's defense attorney suggesting that they are, in fact, going to potentially have an alibi for him. And that is something that might be potentially brought up in court. Connor would say that there's not much to be said there, and it's just a formality, which is probably accurate as always. Can you tell us just a little bit about your first reaction to this crime prior to there being an arrest and why you specifically were so drawn to this case? Yeah, I can. I I remember the exact moment why I was. And this is why when I was a young man and I was working, working still for the coroner in New Orleans, there was a case that took place in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, just off campus from the University of Florida. And it was not just a case. It was multiple cases and it involved sharp force injuries and it was the Gainesville Ripper. And I thought back to that time as a young investigator, because the person that they identified in that particular case that was eventually arrested and charged and convicted, they were looking at that person for homicides that we had in my jurisdiction. And he had connection to Louisiana. And then, of course, there's always the specter of Bundy, you know, with the Cayo house. And so those two things kind of married up. You had, first off, the common denominator was university. And who would go into a university and and do this sort of thing? And the Gainesville Ripper had male victims. But again, say what you will, you know, you don't have these sorts of things, particularly back then, that would happen in Gainesville, Florida. You didn't have it happened in, T- in Tallahassee, uh, like with the Cayo house. And I, I was taken back for that moment. You know, when I heard about these cases, I thought about what went through my mind, the cases that I was working in New Orleans at the time, because we had a series of serial killings that were going on. And, you know, we were all, I was on a task force, as a matter of fact, and I was thinking, is this guy associated with anything that had happened here? You know, because it's on the I-10 corridor. And then my professor brain kicked in and I began, first off, I began thinking of, as a professor, my kids that I was teaching that I had, it, it'll, it'll be a, a year, uh, a year ago in just about six weeks when fall semester began. And I began to know these kids that come into my class and here you, you roll into Thanksgiving and you think about them and they, they're sick of you and you're sick of them, but they're still my kids. And then I thought as a father, because my child was a sophomore in college last year, he's a junior this year. And I had a daughter that went to my university. And immediately, you know, all of that kind of spun up inside of me. And that's why, yeah, it, I was in the middle, you know, back then I was just coming off of covering Gabby Petito and all the storm that that had kicked up. I was road weary, you know, by that time. And I was suddenly in a real twisted way and reinvigorated when it came to this case, because I knew that I could in some way identify with the environment in which this took place because I was so familiar with it, both as a death investigator, forensic scientist, but also as a professor and a father. So it, it hit, it ticked a lot of boxes with me. And, and plus it's rural. 
I knew immediately because I've actually got a colleague that's we shared office space together. Actually, he was down the hall from me and he's from Idaho and he had attended the University of Idaho. And I thought about, you know, my friend and immediately I went and talked to him, you know, give me the lay of the land, you know, tell me what's going on with this case and what, not the case, but tell me about the place, you know, and suddenly I, I saw, started seeing parallels between Moscow and, and Jacksonville where I live, Jacksonville, Alabama, you know, where our university is. Campuses are roughly the same size. We're both rural, though they are more isolated than we are. We're only 90 miles from Atlanta, but still we're a rural place. And I thought about the kids that we have. We've got brilliant people on our campus, but, you know, we're, we don't have people that have matriculated from going to Harvard and all those sorts of places. They're common, everyday, salt of the earth people that, you know, that come from families that are probably in pretty close proximity. You've got generations that would have attended this school just like my school. And so it just really grabbed me by my throat. You know, when this happened, I couldn't believe that it was happening, that it had happened. And to this degree, when the information began to come out, I was thinking, oh my Lord, this is, this is horrible. Absolutely horrible. Who and, and then on top of it, you know, because the first thing I think is angry boyfriend. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking angry boyfriend. We're going to find out in the next 24 hours, this is some kid that got in a twist because he got rejected or whatever it was. And then nothing. It was cricket. And suddenly I'm thinking, oh, my Lord. OK, I have to go to my map. What major interstates run through this location? There's just some place that some animal could have jumped off of the road and just decided to target these kids randomly. And I'm thinking, you don't, you don't wind up in this town by accident. You have to be purpose to be going there. It's not a suitcase college either. It's not a place where kids are going to pack up Friday morning. You know, you've got to, unless you're going across the state line to Washington, you know, in Pullman, maybe it's not an easy trek even to get to Boise. I mean, it's, it's a poke wherever you go. So a lot of these kids stay there, you know, they stay there, but they were going home for Thanksgiving. They'd make that big drive or go to the local airport and try to get on a plane and go home for at least a bit. These people really invested in this location. So in turn, it, it left me being very, very invested in this investigation as it's kind of played out. Connor, how about you? My initial reaction, I was sort of just amazed at four people being stabbed in a college town. The news is full of shootings. I've covered a bunch of shootings. Uh, I get alerts all the time for people shot in a shopping mall, people shot at a picnic, people shot at a house party, people shot everywhere. You know, to get an alert for stabbings, college kids, it stuck out and it blew my mind because it's so out of the normal of what American society is. And I mean, let, let's be basic, like gun violence in our country is really normal. Stabbings just aren't. And if you hear of a stabbing, it's usually, you know, two people who are in a relationship where a fight's gone wrong. And so to hear four people in a college house, I mean, that just sort of it blew my mind. And it's just so out of the the normal view and conversation of violence in this country I, that I just wasn't expecting it. I, it became really clear, I think, really early on that there is something more to this story. I didn't have the f idea that this was a lover's quarrel gone wrong because how do you explain the other people and, and so i was definitely interested from the very beginning because it just it didn't seem to line up with what we sort of knew but there was something more to this story that was clear very early on and joseph we had just come off the heels at that time of george wagner's trial and his recent guilty verdict and were frankly just wiped out from the sadness that surrounded that case, right? And we we were so happy for the Roden family to have finally felt some justice. And then the news gets you. And sure enough, you see those beautiful faces and lost souls and families crying and a town grieving. I feel like we all kind of knew quickly that we had to jump in. Yeah, I'd, I'd certainly agree with that, Steph. It's, you know, for anybody that's ever spent time in a, in a college town and, you know, you have kind of this collegiate family that you're part of. And, and even if it's not, you know, that's, that's a bit arrogant on my part to say that because you're talking about all the other people that are part of that university that may have never matriculated from there, but they're, they're the people that serve dinners. They're the people that pull beers. They're the people that, you know, fix these kids' cars when mom and dad are not around. Just let that sink in for a second, you know, that that whole community is trusted with these kids. You know, when you send your kid to a place like this, there's a whole support system that goes into it. And one little interesting aside from what my understanding is, is that it's so interwoven into the culture there. You can have certain colleges where they 
exist in a town, but they're not part of a town. I've worked at places like that where the college is just kind of isolated. They don't really interact with locals. That's not the way. As a matter of fact, the local police department in this town actually police the campus. And that's, that's kind of odd, you know, when you think about it, because most universities, particularly state universities, will have their own police force. So the police officers that are working the beat on Main Street, that are going to the domestic calls and all that stuff, they handle frat parties, too. They'd be familiar with these kids. These kids' faces would come and go over the years and probably develop relationships with them. I'm sure that probably some of the kids decided to stay after they graduated. Think about that. We're part of the community. They wound up going to a place of college and they never left. You know, they just, they wind up being part and parcel of that environment. And so when I can only imagine that when this happened, many moms and dads in that town, in that region there, you know, suddenly had that parental, you know, that ominous parental feeling that comes over you when something horrible happens. Well, both of you, your compassion and care and how you both treated this case, that obviously remains ongoing and will continue with it. It's frankly been unparalleled. Joseph, we love you to pieces. Hey, love you guys too. It's great to be with you all hanging out. Thank you. Okay. OJ Simpson, Mark. <laughs> I was like, I saw that comment. Who's OJ? The juice. Here, let me get this banner down. I oh, want you guys can see me um again but that's the end of the podcast um i believe for the whole like season um I'm like where am i at there i am there i am um until like they start court proceedings so um i had the worst charlie horse a second ago though i'm glad i wasn't on camera i like had to jump up i got one in my um in my thigh of all places like oh you're okay, Ashley. Hmm. Hey, Olivia. And Jan, you made it through the live. You made it through. I know you weren't feeling good. Hmm. I've been having a headache off and on all night. So I think I'm going to go ahead and jump off of here kind of early tonight. Um, we usually stick around and we talk a lot more, but I don't know. My head's just been kind of feeling a little funny today. Um, I Like I said, I usually get Botox every we were doing it every six months. Now we're doing it every three months because I've been getting headaches more. And I think it's because I'm, I'm reading more. I'm looking more on the screen. Um, especially, you know, being blind in one eye, you're this, I'm overworking the eye. So I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to go rest it. I think that's what it, I need. Just a little rest. But hopefully you guys are all having a great weekend and um, I will be back on tomorrow. I think that we might try to stream the court TV, um, Thing on Brian Koberger, I don't see why we couldn't. I mean, they've let us do like we've streamed Court TV before plenty of times on the on the channel, so that shouldn't be a problem. Because I want to watch that. I think that'd be really, that's going to be really good. It's going to be um, if you missed the beginning of the live, it's going to go over Brian Koberger and like the um the evidence that they have against him and all of that. So thanks, Auto. Me too. I think I get it on the. This month, maybe next month, maybe next, the first week of next month. I can't remember. I do have my calendar up here though, with my appointment dates on there. Cause I kept forgetting my appointments. Whoops. <laughs> so I'm going to jump off of here, but I hope you guys all have a great evening. Um, I will be back tomorrow. We'll probably do like an earlier live. I've been trying to do them at seven 15, but that eight 15 spots just still there with me. <laughs> um, but I'm going to try to come on a little bit earlier tomorrow. So. I hope you guys all have a great rest of your evening. Enjoy your Sunday a little bit. Get out there and hang out. It's probably going to be a nice day tomorrow. Um, today was like beautiful here. I mean, it wasn't like hot or anything, but it was like sunny. So I can handle that. But thank you guys all for joining me. Don't forget, you know, the 13th will mark one year from the, the day that this happened. And that's Monday. That's like, that's, oh my gosh. I can't believe it's already been a year. That's so... Let's say, I don't even know what to call it, like a one year mark. Like, it's just, I feel for the families. I really do. I feel for the, the friends and the families um, of the victims. So, but um, I will be back on tomorrow night. I hopefully you guys all have a great night and I will see you guys all tomorrow. Bye, guys. Mm -hmm.